You're welcome back. You're still watching The Pulse on the Joy News channel on Multi TV. Now, with the polls over and the transition process underway, the question on the lips of many Ghanaians is, who will the president-elect Akufuado choose to help him run his government to achieve many promises made to Ghanaians? Well, our interest today is on the health sector. What are the expectations? What are the key issues that a new administration will have to deal with in detail? Well, joining us in studio is Cecilia Seno. She's the executive director for the Hope Future Generations and a member of the Coalition of NGOs in Health. Thank you, madam, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, I will not go into, into the politics, so not to worry. It's okay. purely on the issues. That's no, okay. Before we talk about the expectation for the new administration, yeah. what will be your own assessment of the four years in our health sector? Has it been the best? Yes and no. It has not been the best. A lot of efforts has gone in, but we still have issues at the health, sec uh, health sector. Hmm. We still have issues with uh, maternal mortality, though a lot is being done. Neonatal mortality is still an issue. The services at the grassroots, a lot of efforts going in, but still we don't have the services as we expect it to be. Hmm. Adolescent sexual reproductive health is still an issue. Awareness, education is going on. And I think we still continue to depend a lot on uh, donor funding. We still don't own our own health sector. It's being run under the, a lot of resources coming from donors. And uh, some of us, especially in the area of civil society, will expect that the country should start looking at its own resources okay. to develop health and let health reach the grassroots as it's supposed to be. Okay. So let's, let's analyze the work. And with the explanation you just gave, it looks as though you are not satisfied with the work that has gone into these key areas. Yeah. What is it down to? Lack of funding? Or we are not, we are not targeting the problem well enough to fix it? Um, I think funding is an issue. Um, we, 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 I won't say that uh, we have some sort of misplaced priorities. But uh, if you see women dying out of certain areas, services not getting to people, we still have issues with uh, family planning, mm. uh, acceptance rate, and all those things. What, I think, what do the numbers speak to in that regard of women dying? Um, I, I, I am not very sure. I wouldn't like to talk a lot about figures because, uh, but I still know that services getting to people, we still have a lot of young people. We still have issues with uh, comprehensive abortion care. I mean, you go to the villages which uh, I really work with, it's mm -hmm. an issue. Recently, I had a program with uh, Mampon School for the, uh, the uh, death and uh, this, and then I realized that I think they, there are so many things to be done for these disadvantaged and unserved people. Issues of health, they, they, they are still in a sort of different world when it comes to adolescent sexual mm -hmm. About 300, 500 young boys and girls who have problem with hearing and cannot really understand some of the issues still have some myth, myth and misconception about sex. Okay. And so I think we still have a lot to do what as a country. What are some of the myths and misconceptions they have? Uh, I was so amazed when uh, one of them, it was uh, as part of our 15 years anniversary as an organization, mm. and one of them told us that uh, she, he, he heard that his, excuse me, to his sperm is dirty and he has to release his sperm and he, so he has to have sex because they told him that if you don't have sex, you can die. And the girls also believe that having sex is something that they have to do. Okay. And so you see a lot of such things happening among them and we realize that as an organization, as a, a working in the health sector, we have a lot to do because it's a, it's a forgotten area that we don't think about. Okay, so um, help me understand this. You're saying that we are doing more of focusing on the structures, yeah. infrastructure mm -hmm. in these communities. Yeah. But the issues of awareness and treating the problems in these areas health-wise yeah. is, is not being done, wrong targeting. Yeah, it is not being done because uh, we, we really have to look at the partnerships that we do at the community level. Mm. Uh, partnership with community structures are very important. If I talk about community structures, what structures already exist, the traditional leaders, they have a lot of capacity that we can bring on board. We have civil society, we have churches, the faith-based organizations who are doing a lot. Mm -hmm. How can we partner all these people and have one voice and see where the strength is, what Ghana Health Service cannot do? 
I talk a lot about tax shifting. Ghana Health Service cannot do it all. They have to look at what they can do and let others also do what they can do. Because communities, if, if, whether you like it or not, the issue is behavior change. Everybody is aware of what to do, but how to change the behavior. And you need certain skills to really ensure that people change behavior. Civil society has that skill. Traditional community people have that skill. So listening to these people, what they want, what is not working, is not what we plan at the higher level mm. and bring. We should look at it from the, from the grassroots and then develop programs that really will satisfy so, them. So there's a disconnect between the health service management and their policy they are drawing up as against the practicality on the ground? I think that we have some disconnects. I mean, we have all these policies. Mm. When it comes to the health sector policies, they are there. When it comes to adolescent sexual reproductive health policy, we have there. Mm. We have them. The policies are all there. How are we implementing these policies? Are we really listening to the people? Do we take our time to identify gaps and try to bridge those gaps or we are just implementing programs? Do we really listen to the people, take what their needs are, or we sit down and assume that this is your need, so this is what I have to do? Two, the reason why I talk about uh, our own resources is that if you are using donor funding, the donor determines what you should use their money for. And so if adolescent reproductive health or maternal issues or maternal mortality, family planning is not part of their agenda, and then and that is the money they give you, you have to shift focus to that. And so you are not really addressing the needs of the people. And that is what I'm saying that as a country, we should start thinking of our own resources. Mm. How do we use our own resources to achieve our own developmental agenda and listening to the people? The planning shouldn't be from here. The planning should be from the grassroots okay. before you can reach the people and satisfy their needs and then move forward as a country. That's for dealing with the problems on a, on a larger scale. But yeah. let's talk about the labor actions that we saw on the health front. Nurses went on strike. Mm -hmm. In the four years, we saw doctors also go on strike. It took a very last minute effort before they backtracked and returned to work. Yeah. Did these things take away from our management of the health sector? It did. You know, the, the workforce is very important when it comes to, the, to health service provision, you know. And if they are not satisfied, they have issues that are not addressed. Don't expect to see a perfect or a good health service because the people are already not happy. They are agitating. There are so many issues coming up. So they will never listen to the patient that is coming. That interpersonal relationship will not be up to what we all expect mm. because you expect that when I fall sick and I go to the health sector, I should have some sort of satisfactory service. But if the people are on strike and you go there, it's like we are providing, we are giving you something, not that it is your basic right, but we are doing you a favor. And so there is no way they will listen. And so this agitative, whatever it is, has to be addressed. It's not just touching it one, but I think that it should be something that we should address once and for all. Give people the realistic wages that they need. Listen to them what they need. But then we must also look at the human resource. Is there any performance appraiser? Is there something, are we doing something on performance management or we are just there, money comes, we pay? How are you assessing people's performance Paying them based on their performance. In the civil society sector, we pay based on your performance because we are struggling to get our own money. So the little that you have, you want to get somebody with multi-skill, somebody who can deliver. Mm. And so that is the way we work in the civil, uh, civil society sector. Can the government start looking at some of these best practices in the private sector and move it into the public sector so that people don't just think that anything goes, whether I work or not, I can get my salary. It okay. should not be. Okay. Let's assume I'm the president sitting here. Yes. And you have concerns about the health sector. Yeah. What would you tell me? Uh, I think what I would say is that just look at the gaps. What is not working? I think there has been presidents and government and government. We cannot go the same way. It is not all size fit all. You have to really objectively look at the gaps. If you have very little resources, you must set priorities. You don't just put it in. What gaps exist? Listen to the people, not what you want people to tell you. Let the people tell you the truth. You can set up an independent somebody that you know objectively will tell you the truth. The moment you get those things, listen to the people who also use the services. Because the client also have a lot of concern that they can share. Mm. 
Take your time, look at all this, this, and ta start targeting these issues one by one. You don't do all at the same time. Set priorities and move on. And, and the important thing is to set our priorities and partnerships. One person cannot do it. Look at all other people who can come together. It's a multi-sectorial approach. Mm -hmm. the, 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 all the ministries cont contribute something to health sector. The health sector doesn't belong to only health. Education, transport, agriculture, they are all part of it. And I wish this government, the current government, would or the, the new government mm -hmm. would take time and look at that bigger partnership. What other things can we bring together to support the health sector? I, I disagree that health sector only belongs to health people who are doctors and nurses or laboratory or x-ray. It is never like that. Mm. Different people play different roles and we need to look at all the multi-sectoral who has something to do. If I'm pregnant and I'm in labor and the road is very bad, you cannot take me to a hospital. I can deliver on the way I can abort, anything can happen. Mm. And so I'm just looking at something the government can really take its time. It is not just rushing to deliver, but look at what I can do and do it to the need of the people at, at the community level. If you were to be appointed health minister, what would be your top priorities in dealing with the issues in the health sector? Uh, the first thing I'll look at is human resource. The, the, you see, you need highly motivated people to deliver. You think we don't have them? We have them, but are they really motivated to do what they're supposed to do? There are different people. The, the, the health sector has a lot of people with skills, but how are they being monitored to do what they're supposed to do? If the, the, the person at this level mm -hmm. is not checking the person under that person, who will be here responsible? There should be sanction. If you are a supervisor, you are supposed to supervise people to do certain things. You must have a set of objectives and targets. And you must be assessed based of, on your performance. It is not just like, maybe you are my friend, whether I work or not, if you talk. No, no, no. We must really, really start looking at health sector as a business. And then reach the people who need it. Otherwise, we will still continue the same way. And that is what I expect this government to start looking at. It is not my people, my relatives, my friends. We should really look at the health sector as a business. If somebody is not performing, they should not hesitate telling the person to pack and leave. And so there should be certain way of assessing people's performance. People must have a clear job descriptions that can be monitored, a clear performance appraisal that we get serious people to look at it. What do you want? And they must assess the people. If you are not doing it, pack and leave. Don't stay there. Should we do the same for the minister? Set targets for him so that he trickles it down to the many sectors, uh, many uh, departments and agencies under his ministry? I think that is the way everybody, the moment you are taking taxpayers' money as a salary, you are supposed to be answering to the taxpayer. Mm. And that has to be, for me, that is, to me, that is the biggest thing. Because if the people who are at the helm of affairs are not doing what they're supposed to do, and a lot of things are happening in the health sector, I think people out there will not know, but people in know that there are issues that need to be tackled. Everybody should have, if the health minister is giving target, you are supposed to deliver A, B, C, D. People who report to you, you must monitor. And the president or office of the president is monitoring the health. I mean, it is not just saying they're changing. You can bring anybody. They should really give target to everybody. You give target, you monitor. If you don't perform, if you perform 10% of that, they pay you 10%. If you don't do it well, you don't take your money. I think these are some of that the things like we should be looking at. That sounds like public sector reform in my view. Well, what it is. I, I think... That is business. I mean, just, I want all, everybody should start looking at health as business. It is not health like it's for doctors, it's for nurses. It's for everybody, including okay. you. We don't, re and the, the minister, everybody, when they fall sick, they must assess services in Ghana. It is not only for the poor people. A lot of resources has gone into NHIS, a lot of issues. Everybody is talking about universal health uh, coverage. Mm. Where are we as a country? Why do, you think, why do you think NHIS is not doing too well like it should? Uh, I think I have been part of the review of the NHIS. Uh, we all got, we heard that there has been a lot of uh, corruption in the NHIS. And there are, uh, the, the, the structures are there, but are the structures really working the why way is it, not it working? is? It comes back to monitoring and supervision. It's still, you see, when, when you, you can only achieve results, when you, people you put there have the skill, they know that this is what I'm supposed to do, and they are being monitored. It's the same way their work is being monitored. We don't 
good money. It just put people there 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, whatever it is. Nothing is showing. Unqualified. Well, I, I would not say whether I still think that monitoring and really making sure that people do what they're supposed to do is very important. Mm. It's not just bringing people, but it should be people who really have that motivation to work, people who know that I'm taking this money because I'm delivering this service. And we must really look at that. And to me, that is the first thing I will look at. As okay. a, as a One last thing that's come up that I wanted to briefly talk about is um, the issue of the antiretroviral drugs. It became an issue. I think late last year into this year. Yeah. Do you think as a country we are paying a lot more attention to dealing with HIV AIDS? Um, again, yes and no. The reason is that I know Ghana AIDS Commission is actually the coordinating body set up by the government. I've been part of, I'm part of a country coordinating mechanism which oversees uh, global fund resources. Mm. I, I, I still think that we, we are not tackling it the way we're supposed to be because I know Global Fund has some sort of, sort of matching grant from government. If they bring this, the government has to put this in. Mm. There has been sh periodic shortages and rationing of ARV. And there has been other issues. Even managing the, the, the chain, the, the way the drug has to move from the, the store, the medical store to the facilities is also an issue. And I think you go to some of the facilities and you see drugs expiring there and you go to another shortage. So the whole thing again boils up to monitoring. Who is responsible? Who, and when you talk about some of these things, nobody, there is no sanction. You can just, whether you do it or not, nobody will. And I think there is a, a, an issue addressing some of the ARVs in the sector. Okay. But I'm saying, before I let you go, let me put you on the spot here. If you were to choose who yeah. the next health minister should be, can you make that choice? Um, I cannot mention name, but I will, not because I'm a woman, mm -hmm. but I will really choose a woman to be the health Why minister. Why can't you mention name? You can mention it. Why not? Uh, I, 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 I think I have many of them in mind. Give me three. <laughs> um... Um, from both NDC and MPP. Well, the MPP is coming <laughs> into power, so obviously that's where it will come from. I, I, I see uh, Shelly Ayoko uh, very passionate. I, mean, I have not been so close to her, but I've been listening to that passion and the way she talks. Um, I see this woman, um, uh, what's her name? Opari, uh, what's her name? Prima Opari. Prima Opari. She has some social work. She does a lot of social work mm. and social issues. I'm calling women because I know the passion women for help, have for help. I, these are people in my mind. Um, I don't know the third person that I want, but these two people, I think they between are people. One of that, I mean, yes, I, mean, I one wish. Of job. Yes, but I will still urge the government to consider appointing a woman as a health minister. Okay, thank you, Madam, for joining us today. Thank you very much. And uh, that's uh, Madam Cecilia Senu. She is uh, a member of the Coalition of NGOs in Health, sharing her thoughts with us on this sector in general, on health and what should be done in that regard. She's already given us names of who should be the health minister for the new administration. Let's see what happens in the coming days. Well, still speaking of women and choices, she was undoubtedly one of the best women to head the Women and Children's Affairs Ministry in the Estuar Force administration. She lost her seat as MP for Gambagan and Irugu, but she's back in politics again, not only representing her constituents, but also the transition spokesperson on local government for the MPP. So Kwame Boateng has been spending some time with her today, speaking to her about the new MPP and what role women will play in this new government. And I'm, the woman I'm referring to is Hajia Alima Mahama. Maybe, maybe I've... Maybe a little bit of maturity with age, you know, mm. you become calmer and more patient, more tolerant. I think I've become a bit more tolerant and more patient. Mm. Yeah. So, so you're not going to see that um, uh, vigorous argument there. Oh, after, after the vigorous the argument, uh, the, the vigorous argument, it go, it goes on. But in terms of interaction with people and all that, maybe I become more tolerant and more patient. But the vigorous argument is going to go on. We're going to be strong. We're going to uh, stay 
our uh, stay our course. We're going to push. I mean, Ghana wants us to deliver, mm. and we are not going to allow you know who is going to mess around with us. I mean, we have to push them and, and let people know that yes, this is the way we are going, and these are the issues. If there is any misunderstanding about an issue on the floor of parliament, we have to jump up and, and, and put the things right. Yeah, I may be that. wrong, but I believe a number of people were happy when they heard you were coming back uh, to parliament. Uh, you didn't want to contest again in 2012. What made you change your mind and, uh, and came back? Yeah, so I also want to believe that a lot of people are happy I, because I got a lot of con congratulatory messages and my friends even tell me people are calling congratulating them or other. So I believe a lot of people are happy. And definitely my constituents are happy. They have brought me back to parliament. Uh, I decided just to take a rest for a while and allow other people to try. I uh, ran for three consecutive terms, 2000, 2004, and 2008. So 2012, I said, look, let me let other people try because usually in the constituents, some people also want to be given opportunities. So I just said, let me let other people try. Besides, I had been out of the country. I was in Liberia for two years. Mm. And I came back at the end of two years, the end of 2011. So I said, well, let me just let other people try. Mm -hmm. And I supported the candidate then. Mm -hmm. And we worked hard. And he lost just narrowly. But 2004, come 2004, Fifteen, where we had the primaries, I said, look, I mean, I could do more for my country and my mm. district by running. Let me go. Let me give it a go. Besides, I was, I, I felt, look, this is a time we should all work hard. And the comments and I was getting from the community, I believe that if I put myself out, I would win for MPP. So what would you want to I achieve win with your MPP. comeback? Uh, basically... I come from a, a poor district, and then my area is very impoverished and very uh, low infrastru uh, infrastructure. Over the years we've done, but uh, there's still a lot more to do, like basic water, roads, infrastructure. Just I'm even talking about just simple, I'm not talking about asphalt and roads, but just uh, simple roads, bridges to make uh, uh, places accessible. You go to a community and you just feel sad because you tell yourself, if a woman is in labor, how is this woman ever going to get to hospital? And in many of these communities, they don't have uh, chips compound. They don't have nurses. They don't have chips compound. You could, you could have helped them when you were in parliament. Then. I did. I did. I, I did a lot. I even got a nursing training college yeah. in my constituency. I got a nursing training college. I got a girls' secondary school. I did a lot of bridges and infrastructure. But when you have communities of uh, uh, constituency with communities over 200 villages, there's a lot to be done. And I felt that I had had the experience where I could, even before going to politics, I was working with uh, Nord Northern Region Rural Integrated mm -hmm. Program, which is a development-based mm -hmm. program. And we were doing water in the program. We were doing women credit programs in the program before I went uh, uh, into politics. And it's, it's just something that we have to continuously do. And even the water breaks down and the, the system, there's no maintenance system integrator, even though the district assemblies have their water uh, management boards and all that. I found a lot of the boreholes that we even put while at NORIP and while we were in government had broken down. So, so how are you going to get funding to do all this? Because I know some or ma majority of what you've enumerated uh, are to be done basically by the various district assemblies. You are not there, you are MP. MP elect going to be sworn in. How are you going to get money to do all these things? One, when you are uh, an MP, you are a member of the district assembly, non voting. I think uh, you are a member of the district assembly, district assembly. And you can be at the executive committee meetings and also provide some ideas mm. and direction. And coming from the district and having worked in the district dating back uh, 87. To date, they, they, they respect my opinion and they respect my views. So I can provide some kind of directions mm -hmm. for the district assemblies, yes. Also, our party, as a policy initiative, has indicated that they will be putting $1 million per constituency in the hands of a, a, a constituency. That, again, will be an area that I will think I will play a role in directing the appropriate investments mm. 
other in infrastructure so, uh, and other socioeconomic services for the people. I think so there will be some resources for us to put, but we need to have provide some leadership. We need to provide some direction for people to be able to direct the investment to have yield some dividends for mm -hmm. the community, for the community to feel that yes, our, uh, we are being served, the things we need are being provided. We direct the resources to tailor to the needs of the people. When, when given the opportunity to speak to an Anado, president-elect, mm -hmm. about what he can focus on maybe the first 100 days, what would you tell him? What areas would you want him to consider? <laughs> the, when we are running for elections, it's obvious that the youth won the elections for us. Very obvious. The youth were all out there, mm -hmm. and that's because of job creation. In 100 days, it's difficult to actually put jobs out there for the people. Mm -hmm. But for a period of the first one year, we should be, take, tailor, be looking at jobs for the people. I, I believe that. And then the, the next thing for me, coming from the kind of place that I come, they looking at basic infrastructure for the people, water. So he should water. focus his first year on creating jobs for the people. Thinking then about the second it, uh, year, yeah. maybe infrastructure, yeah. providing ba basic, basic social amenities. So, social amenities, yes. That's, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. The youth uh, well, came out seriously, and it was clear. We want jobs. So we have to start thinking about what do we do to create jobs for the uh, people. And I'm sure they are working on it. There are already some initiatives in that direction and all that. This one district, one factory, if we are able to uh, put it on board, this, uh, it will be another way of Are you going to put it on board or if you are able? Because no, your critics we are going to put it on board. We are going to put it on board. Not when, when we start, no, you're talking about 100 days. Mm. And I'm saying that we start in 100 days, it will be difficult to uh, go so you broke them down that so we'll first year and now you focus year. on job curation, yeah. second year uh, providing basic social amenities, yeah. then the third year we start campaigning like, again. No, no. Well, you can campaign and we do your work. You can campaign and we do your work. But this process of uh, job creation and social amenities, um, it's not just going to be one year that you stop one year. So it's a continuous program. Mm -hmm. The job creation is going to be a continuous program. Like one district, one factory, it will be a continuous, mm -hmm. it will be a continuous program. It's not, uh, I'm not kidding myself to think that in the first year, all the districts will have all their factories. It's a continuous program for the first four years. So we'll have that. We'll have the uh, social, socioeconomic and basic infrastructure amenities going on. And definitely we have to put agriculture back on track. Mm -hmm. Agricultural uh, uh, productivity decreased. Investment in agriculture when decreased, mm. well, and majority of the citizens of this country are into agriculture. Mm. Agriculture has been put out, and it's one of the key areas that uh, policy initiative that we had in our manifesto. You could have been the vice president elect today, right? Why? Because we heard rumors in the past that Nana was considering uh, picking you as his running mate. Was that true? Were you contacted? It was in this. Uh, my name was in the discussion. I wouldn't say it was anything constant that Ali was. But, but, did Nana but my name you? featured. Did my Nana name contact featured you? In, in, in the discussion. I said my name featured. And what did in you the tell discussion. him when he contacted you? No, me? not contacting me as such. It was part of the discussion going mm. on. It would be nice. It would be nice to have a capable woman as vice president of this country. Why not? It was part of discussion. But at the end of the day, is a collective decision. At